So in this tutorial we will learn how to make a cave from another cave. This first cave looks rather bad. The second cave looks of course very good because I made it. <laughs> and the uh, key points to learn from this video are uh, what is the correct sun strength? Is it one? Is it two? Then what is the texture interpolation? And how could we make water without water simulation? Which actually looks like a real water, you know. There are also some other stuff like composition, lighting, all sorts of stuff I made there. And you will get to know all of that. So let's get to the workshop. The workshop is down there. I just made it yesterday, I think. So first you should think what kind of a scene you actually want to create. Make a little sketch if you feel like that and then search for that place in Minecraft. My idea was volumetric light, so the best choice for me was a cave with a hole, and I left my player into this very same cave you see here. Now to export that cave we use Mineways, and right now it works correctly on Windows only, so I had to leave my comfort zone and use Windows, which actually wasn't so traumatizing this time. As you see, I open my world from here, select the chunk by right clicking and export it for rendering in the obg file format. Use these final settings as they allow you to move blocks around, and now let's jump into Blender. So now that Blender is open, we're first gonna enable the Node Wrangler add-on, because it wouldn't be a legit tutorial without it, and then let's import the cave. So go to File, Import, OBG, and find your file. The import takes a few minutes, but luckily I have a few editing skills as well, so here you go, the cave is imported, now we need to zoom out and start dealing with this choppy viewport. To make the viewport smoother, we have to delete some geometry, but right now we don't know yet what to delete. So first we have to position the camera, and then we can remove all that stuff we don't need. So press 0 on your number pad or click this camera icon to go to camera view and before we start moving in any direction we should think what we actually want to see in this scene. I personally want to have a light beam and some water, so an easy compositional way is to place the most important element of the scene on the third line and the most important element is the light beam. By the way you can see the third lines if you turn them on from here. And for the water basically throw it wherever it fits because secondary elements don't need so much love. So I just made the focal length a bit shorter to have some space for it and now the camera is in its place. We can start deleting blocks that are not visible now. And this is easy, you just use B, box select the blocks you don't need and delete them with X. I will remove most of the blocks that I can't see from the camera and when you've done that too, let's fill in the holes that let light into the cave. Basically I could use a plane and cover these holes that way, but I thought I could show some use of Alt-D here. So Alt-D and Shift-D both create a clone of your object, but Shift-D creates new object data. Alt-D uses the same data and that means your copy follows the shape of the original. But where Alt-D is really useful is it's saving memory. For example when you have a render with let's say 7 trees and each tree takes 1GB of RAM, when you copy this with Alt-D your total RAM usage is 1GB, but with Shift-D it's 7 gigs. So if your GPU has too little video memory you can't render using your graphics card. And I can't use my graphics card anyways because I use a Mac and yeah but this project will still open faster because I copy with Alt-D and that's why I'm using it. And you should use the snap mode with shift tab so that the blocks will stay on the grid. And when the holes are closed let's start messing with the materials. So go to the material view with Z and discover that your materials look very blurry and not blocky like in Minecraft. So to get rid of that we have to change the interpolation which is very hard to pronounce and also how computers approximate pixels. So open up a new window for the shader editor and click on the block you think would deserve to be interpolated. Change the interpolation to closest and as you see it made it look like Minecraft. Let's also make the other blocks Minecrafty and now that everything we see is very Minecrafty and Minecraftish we still have one problem and the problem is that the walls don't have any imperfections at all, which makes them look rather boring. For that we can use bump. So add a bump node and connect the texture to the height and these walls just look so much better now. I'm also gonna use it on the dirt blocks. I made a little break to clear my head and came back around 10 minutes later, saw the textures and the bump and really everything we've been doing so far and I felt we could add some more elements. So I thought why not add some glowing blocks on the right side. For that let's swap out the material of a stone block, so select the stone block and click on this number which creates a separate material copy of the material of the stone block. If you forget that you will swap the material of all the stone blocks and this is uncomfortable. So first I'll swap the stone texture with the lapis lazuli and then add an emission shader here and mix it with the original using the mix shader. To make it glow in its original colors I will use the lapis lazuli texture as the color of the emission node. Now we have to specify the areas where the block has to use the emission shader and where it has to use the principal shader. We can connect the same lazuli texture to the mix shader factor and now we just have to modify the colors a bit because the mix shader factor works with grayscale images, where black is 0% of something and white is 100% of something. This is our current factor input and this is the same image in grayscale. I think you can see the problem that we don't have a strictly black and white image but instead some grey tones in between and not the result we want. Here we can see exactly where the two shaders are mapped. To get such results we can use a color ramp. 
drop it between the image and the factor and preview it using Ctrl Shift click. The work will be easier in constant mode. Move the sliders until the result is there and then preview the mix shader node. We can't see anything yet because we don't have Bloom turned on, so go to the render settings of Eevee and turn on Ambient Occlusion, which adds a bit of realism and also turn on Bloom. Increase the emission strength so that you see what the material looks like. It's working as it should, but the emission and diffuse shaders are inverted, so we can either invert the factor or swap these inputs. Now the block looks as we imagined. Turn the strength back to 1 and now let's add in the creeper because the left side of the scene is very empty. I could have modeled the creeper myself, but I was too lazy, so I went to Sketchfab where I found this nice looking creeper from Vincent Yanez. Thank you, Vincent. And it was also free, so double thanks. One thing to mention about Sketchfab is that it also has a plugin to download three models right into Blender without using any Finder or Explorer, or I don't know, is it Pingo, the Explorer in Linux, whatever it is, but I haven't tried the plugin yet. But I'll leave a link, because I'm nice. Now let's import the creeper from the same menu as always and this time let's choose FBX instead of OBG. When the creeper is in the scene, move it up on the Z axis because everything you import goes to the world origin, which happens to be under the cave. Now for the creeper we should scale it 1.7 blocks high as this is the correct height and then do some positioning as well so that he's contributing to the scene in a meaningful way. I thought maybe he could look at the dynamite block in the wall and then I made this mistake of positioning his head before I knew where the textures would be and the result was, as I said before, zero zero retarded. So don't follow these steps. Instead add the texture first. In the material add an image texture node, select the texture from the creeper folder and connect to the base color. Now position the creeper with G shift Z which means he will move up or down on the Z axis and if you want to position body parts use L to select the head for example and then rotate with either double R or just R. If you want to lock the rotation to an axis press R X R Y or R R R R R Z. <laughs> also in the material add bump in the same way we added to the stone and dirt box and now let's add the TNT block. First let's select the block we want to turn into a nice TNT and then let's make a material copy for it by clicking on this number again. And now we need a texture which you can download from the description or from Google or Bing or Yahoo, just make sure it looks dangerous. Now load the texture into the image texture node and pull open a new UV editor window because as you see the texture is not behaving as we want to. To make it appear correct we have to enter edit mode and in the editor scale the cube faces to match one face of the TNT. So scale the face by 0.5 and move it to the face we want to use, so 0.25 on the y axis and also on the x axis and the TNT looks correct now. We don't have to make the other faces look right because we'll only see this one. We've been adding bump to everything so far and the material already has bump, but to make it look better and grab more attention we can use the same image as before but this time with linear interpolation. I think it looks more like a wooden crate this way. And uh, who wouldn't love to create a great crate? Now before we start creating the water, I'll just quickly add some more glowing blocks there and some coal ore here. If you add the same material to more than one block, you can use material links. So select the blocks that will share the material and make sure the block where you copy from is yellow, so select it last. And use Ctrl L, make links and choose materials. Now let's continue by creating the water surface and we're not gonna do any power hungry water simulation or stuff, but instead we'll use dynamic paint. We need a water surface so add a new plane in the scene and move it so that the tip is in the tip if it's even an English expression, but the point is that the plane has to be in this exact point. Usually YouTubers said to do it because of the OCD, well that's something I don't have, so instead I'm gonna extrude this side and this side so the waves which will be created will actually bounce back from these walls. Now let's add some more detailed geometry as the waves need more faces in order to look like ones. I'm gonna add some loop cuts with Ctrl R to have square faces instead of rectangles because rectangles are bad. Sorry rectangles. And when the loop cuts are there right click on the plane and subdivide it a number of times. Now the plane is ready to be dynamically painted but we need something that influences the plane. It could be a monkey head or a cube or any kind of mesh actually, so I went for a sphere. Move it somewhere on the plane and under physics settings of the plane change it to dynamically painted canvas with a surface type of waves. Same thing for the sphere as well but this one's going to be a brush instead of a canvas. So now it's time for le grand moment, as the French would say, because will there actually be waves when you press the spacebar? The crowd is going mad and we do have the waves! Well done, monsieur. Now move the sphere around until you find the surface you like and then stop the animation with spacebar again. To make the water surface keep the waves, go to object, then select convert and reconvert it to a mesh. Now the waves are fixed in place. 
We also need the water materials to go to the shader editor and create a new one. I initially wanted to start messing with the glass shader but because we don't have to see through the water surface, a metal shader works just as well and gives us faster render times. So turn up the metalness and bring down the roughness and the surface looks just like water does. Now we're officially finished with the materials and the next stop is lighting. Before we add any lamps, let's close the entrance to the cave so that no external light gets in. If you do want to see the light coming into the cave, don't close it, but I feel it looks nicer this way. If you start lighting, add the most important lamp first, in our case it's the sun lamp. I'm gonna make the hole a bit bigger here so that we have a more powerful beam coming into the cave and also I'm gonna rotate the sun with double R, holding down shift so that I can make some more precise moves. And now when we take a look at the scene with cycles, we get some strong looking garbage and assuming we want to make it better, let's add volumetrics. Volumetric lighting is when you have some small things in there like dust and smoke particles or fog and you can see the light beam coming from your flashlight. Luckily in Blender you don't need to add thousands and thousands of cubes in there but instead just add a volumetric material to an object. So let's add a cube and position and scale the cube so that the whole cave is covered. If you wonder why I'm not just adding volumetrics to the whole world, the answer is that volumetrics need a lot of computing power so the less volumetrics the better performance. When the cube's in place, add a new material and remove the default shader. Add a volume scatter node and don't connect it to the surface yet because doing so, you just get a pitch black material and 20 fun minutes of figuring out what's wrong, only to discover that you plug the volume node into a surface input, so please avoid it. The default density is far too high, so use something like 0.010. And also before we increase the sun strength to actually start seeing something, turn on viewport and join the denoising so we can get rid of that nasty noise. And now increase the sun lamp strength to 400, which sounds crazy, but is actually physically correct. I have a link in the description where you can read a bit more about it, but I also made my own calculations and this number is totally fine, so don't be scared. And if it seems too bright for you, just go to render settings, color management and decrease the exposure. We can also use a physically correct color for the sun and it's around 5700 kelvins. You can enter it by using the black body color node. We could stop the lighting here or go home and be happy, but guys the creeper is risking his life next to a dynamite, so he does deserve some spotlight, right? So when lighting him, we should keep in mind which side of the scene is cold and which one is warm. So after a bit of testing and thinking and rotating, I found a nice two lamp setup which has a blue light that emphasizes the cold and darkness of this side of the cave and a warm light which lights from the brighter and warmer side of the scene. And I also added the skylight which you can do as well by going to the shader editor and go to the world material settings. Again, add a black body node and according to Google, the color of the sky is 7500 kelvins. So type it in the node and you're all good with the sky. If you wonder why I'm not using an HDR, the answer is I actually used it in the beginning, but it adds too much render time for what it brings. Really nothing special. So always consider if a scene really needs an HDR. Now the scene is finished and before we render I'm gonna make some optimizations so that the render will be as fast as possible. First make sure you have rendered denoising, it's either optics or open image, and then make sure the light bounces are all set to 1. Also use a GPU if you have one and use large tile sizes with GPU and small with CPU. For the last thing turn on the mist pass cause everybody likes to hide bad renders with some fog and then press F12 and start the render. The render is done, it took 2 minutes and 10 seconds, if you were faster you should consider subscribing because fast subscribers are the best. Now let's start compositing. Go to the compositing tab and click use nodes. First I'm gonna add some mist, so add a mix node, connect the images and set the blend mode to add. Now we have fog but only a tiny bit, right? Then let's add a glare node. I recommend fog low and tweak the settings as you like, I won't force any settings because glare is such a personal sensitive stuff so do whatever you like with it, right? Then we're gonna add a vignette effect which may look complicated at first but don't worry it actually isn't. The ellipse mask creates a black and white circle and if you mix it with our main image using the multiply blend mode, the areas that happen to be on the black area of the mask will get darker. Now when you blur the ellipse mask we get a smoother result and that's really all for the vignette. I also added the color balance node. You should always use the color balance in the offset power slope version because it does colors correctly. But the mid on wheel suffers from some mathematics that make it work inverted so keep that in mind. For the final polish I added a dust texture with the screen blend mode and made two layers out of it. The first one is the original dust being screened onto the image, the second one is the same dust but with a bokeh blur so that it seems closer to the camera. This little pentagon is here to make the bokeh node work and you could use any shape actually instead of it. I moved the bokeh layer in a different location because otherwise the blurry layer and the sharp layer would match perfectly and it doesn't look the best this way. 
and the compositing is finished. Make sure your last node is connected to the composite output, not the viewer output, and export the result from the image editor. And I know this doesn't look exactly as the thumbnail, but don't worry, I hate that feeling as much as you do, so here's the magical node setup for the final thumbnail. And now that I have revealed my last secret to you, let's get back to the headquarters. So here we are in the headquarters and the last things before we finish this one up are going to be the three tips I gave you in the beginning of this video and these are the sun strength it's going to be around 400 440 was the exact uh, you know size on the web page then there is this texture interpolation if you want to get to Minecraft feel and vibe you should use the closest and if you need a water surface and you don't want to mess with this you know simulation stuff just use a dynamic paint and you're all good to go so these are the main things you should remember if you knew them that's great if you didn't knew you learned something <laughs> so i think i want to wrap this one up and until next time ciao